Hey there! Skullheads, I'm Snags. And I'm all silky! And we gonna ram a Clash episode down your throat tonight. Yeah, we're keeping up with the uh, the whole punk thing. If you have been following the last few episodes, we're really covering the uh, the creme de la. Um, and I, the best of I, the best. Yeah, I do want to mention uh, the website, uh, snagsandsilky.com. Go on there for uh, playlists. Uh, check out other episodes you may have missed. And um, and buy some uh, merch, buy some shirts and stickers and whatnot. Um, but uh, the let's, one uh, thing let's I want to mention. These... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, let's smash these cats in the face with a Clash episode. Yeah, uh, the one thing I want to mention yeah. about the Clash um, early on, uh, when I think of punk, I think of like the Misfits and. Uh, the Ramones, Sex Pistols, stuff like that. And so with The Clash, uh, I kind of lumped them in with um, some of the other, you know, 80s, early 80s, uh, almost pop stuff. It did not. Um, so when people said punk and then they rattled off Debbie Harry and television and Elvis Costello, I was just like, yeah, no. Um, but uh, Snags just continued to chip away at me about the clash. And my, I think my problem was, uh, you know, you'd hear train in vain or something. And I'm like, this is that song. Yeah. But I'd hear it and be like, this isn't punk, you know? And when I read, um, get in the van, the black flag thing, El Condor, El Condor in the house. What right? up, mofo? Yeah. Tell say, everybody, say hi to everybody. Clash rules. Say clash rules. Just say the clash rules. It's for the show. Clash say rules. It. Say it loud. Clash rules. Nice. Damn right. You're raising That's, this kid's anger right. in there. Clash rules. Yeah. No. All right. Hey, he, uh, he did it, man. That was right. perfect, El Condor. That was great, dude. You really night, rocked it. You really You're sold it. Back to bed from going to right. the bathroom. Good night, Peace sir. Bye bye. Um, also, I have a mini fridge now. Oh yeah, he's got a mini fridge. So oh, good. Got it. Um, got to have a place to store the beverages. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so with when I read the um, get in the van, uh, the black flag thing, uh, it really put it into perspective that punk can be really any. Uh, style of music it's it's all the in the attitude and um you know as they said it's all just rock and roll you know um and they uh i think and we'll i'll discuss the one thing i was going to say a little later but um uh, once i got that and and you and and snags continued to kind of you know dude you got to check uh the clash out um and I was familiar with the hits, obviously, but um, going back and hearing uh, like 1977 and White Riot, those are punk. Uh, they were very uh, punk. And then I think uh, to keep themselves um, not to be painted into a corner, they changed their style. And, and I'm sure you'll get into that as we go along, but I think that gave them the longevity and um and the popularity that they uh they certainly deserved there's two types of sincerity with bands i think um some of them they they have a style and they fucking stick with it like motorhead acdc the ramones you know what you're gonna get you drop yes. the needle anywhere on any record and it's gonna be it's going to be their style. Of, yeah, I, I liken that to a, a brand yeah. of whiskey. You're not going to pull it down off the shelf and it's suddenly Pepsi, you know. And then there's another type of, I think, uh, integrity in music where bands, the Beatles being the prime example, everybody brings up, but it's true, that evolve, but they keep their core integrity as they evolve. They're not evolving to please some record 
producer. They're not mm-hmm. evolving out of fear that, hey, we got to have a hit. Uh, uh, they're, they're growing as musicians. Yeah, it's not like the Red Hot Chili Peppers where they have this big hit with Under the Bridge and then every album after that is 10 versions of Under the Bridge forever yeah. till the end of time. Yeah, I, I, I literally can't. I'm like allergic to... Yeah, uh, it's to not that. like that. I'm talking oh. about real growth. This just comes from genuine... And you're right, we will be talking about that. So the Clash are uh, kind of along those lines. Um, my, my experience with the Clash, I think the first time they showed up on my radar around 1982 i'm in uh eighth grade and there was this i went to this little uh kind of alternative school my parents were hippies and this was some kind of little alternative school and it's just a um little private school run by um kind of hippie freaks and there was this punk, punk chick that uh like serious hardcore punk chick she wanted to be susie from susie and the banshees Oh, there you go. And she was always wearing the buttons and safety pin through the cheek every now and then, that kind of shit. And um, she brings this triple vinyl album to school. This is around 1982, a couple years after it came out, called Sandinista. And I was like, fucking triple album, Jesus. And like right after that, this is 1982, Combat Rock drops, and suddenly... Rock the Casbah, and I don't know if you remember that. It was oh, yeah. everywhere, oh, yeah. dude. Yeah, I, it's I on would, the radio. I would venture to the- say, uh, I would venture to say, a lot of people that was their first introduction to uh, the Clash was Rock the Casbah. That was their uh, that was their big breakout right as the band was falling apart, as we'll discuss. But um, uh, it was everywhere. You turn. We had our little local music video channel because Atlanta was too backwater for MTV at the time. Mm-hmm. You turn on that channel. Rock the Casbahs on there. The video. Turn on ninety six Rock, the local rock station. Rock the Casbah. It just was everywhere. Mm-hmm. And um, and I dug it. You know, I I didn't rush out and buy any. All I had was vinyl and cassettes at the time. It's nineteen eighty two. I didn't rush out and buy any Clash, but I didn't dislike it either. Um, forward a little bit later when CDs are coming out, late eighties, early nineties. Um, I pick up London Calling because I actually really like Train in Vain. I, I, yeah, and it's a great I song. Just, yeah, I thought it was a killer tune. I was like, "What Clash mm-hmm. album is that song on?" Mm-hmm. And I pick up London Calling, and then holy crap, that's like one, one gem in a bag of diamonds. You, you know, know, and and I have to interrupt the the best thing about when we were coming up is you'd hear a song and, and that uh, the adventure of tracking what album is that song on? I need yeah. that album. And uh, for me, the first class song that I got into possibly the first one I even heard was should I stay or should I go? And I just, I loved it. Uh, it was incredible to me. Yeah. Uh, I remember some kids in my high school playing that at the talent show a few years oh, yeah. later and uh, they're playing the wrong chords, but you oh, know, they course. have a spirit. Yeah. But, but um, so um, I pick up, uh, this is the CD age now, right? So I pick up London calling and then uh, the first album, the clash and just played the shit out of them. So kids, there was a time when you get into a band, you couldn't just jump on Spotify and make a playlist of every single thing they recorded. Yeah. You had to go spend your hard earned money on one album and you'd listen to it over and over and over again. So you and and usually you had to mow uh, some lawns and, yeah. and actually, actually break a sweat to get 10 bucks yeah. and, or, and or then deal, you... deal drugs or whatever, you know, well, mug an old you... lady. Then you rode your bike uh, probably to some place you weren't allowed to be, and yeah. you'd prop your bike up outside the record store. And I can remember being in the record store, trying to just relax and and enjoy looking for some new band or checking on your your other bands and seeing what you know. I got that, got that, got that. Oh, I need what is I've looked at this, you know, all that. But meanwhile, trying to keep an eye on your bike outside because god forbid your bike got stolen and then you got to go home and maybe say uh my butt well where were you and then you'd you know be yeah. in all kinds of trouble at the strip joint yeah. so 
the the um the um the difficulties we used to go th through to get music we walked to school uphill six miles both ways under uh, fire in um, the snow i can remember so being at camelot records and uh some new um uh maybe it might have been uh motley crew the cd for shout at the devil had had come out and uh and stellar was, album it's a great well album. i was like looking at the back to so oh, maybe the cd will have something else on it and these two smoking hot chicks on the other side of the aisle look over and see motley crew and look at me and they're like eh. and i just i just wanted to to smack them you know that happened to me one time in the mid 90s uh you were there I don't know if you were there when this exact transaction happened, but there were these two girls. We were seeing some band as a friend of yours, and we we're seeing the band as a Dark Horse Tavern or one of those places. Okay. And um, uh, there's these two girls I was chatting up, and everything was fine until they realized I was wearing a Motorhead shirt. And then they were like, oh, you like that kind of music? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, my God. That was it. Hey, if you don't like Motorhead, fuck off. You get that's, the fuck out. That's you know. my... Here's to our Lord and Savior, I said. Yeah, to, to our Lord and Savior. All right, so I had those two CDs. I had a big CD collection, but the Clash element was the first album, London Calling. Played the shit out of those for years. Sometime in the 2000s, I'm, I'm walking down, uh, taking a walk, uh, and uh, there's this couple that's moving out of a house and they have a bunch of stuff on the sidewalk with a little sign that says, you know, up for grabs or take what you want. And I'm, I'm walking by and I noticed they had some DVDs and I start talking CDs. to them. And, what? CDs? No, DVDs. Oh, okay. So I start talking to them, flipping through the DVDs and I find this, documentary called west way to the world and it's about the clash oh nice and i was like oh i like the clash i'll i'll pick this up um and the guy was like yeah help yourself man you can have it i go home and i watch it and a whole deeper level of appreciation just and that's how i got you into it was not too long after that i i you kept telling me the clash sucked and i said watch west way to the world and mm -hmm. tell me the class sucks. Mm -hmm. And you watched it and you were like, holy shit. And that, and then, you know, streaming services come along and oh, yeah. I'm just marathoning the complete well, class. That, that Shea Stadium live. Uh, oh yeah, that's killer. That, it, you can't watch that and come out going, eh, whatever. Uh, it's, just, they're just a great rock band, you know. Yeah. Um, I do, I, my, my angst against them is, um, Joe Strummer's just, he was just so raw antagonistic about, uh, Led Zeppelin or, or, uh, some of these other bands that well, had the, carved the, away, uh, kind of an he's, interesting, interesting he's quoted story. as saying all he has to do to, to throw up is to look at an, a, a Led Zeppelin album cover. And I'm like, oh. yeah, there's an interesting, that kind of hurts, but interesting psychological thing that was happening there because he was in a pub rock band and this will launch us into the the history of the clash here um uh john meller which was his real name his original name non-punk rock name he was a lead singer for a pub rock band called the 101ers right yeah, and, and that's is, actually streaming. You can actually hear that album. It's pretty Yeah, uh, you, you can find that stuff on Spotify. I think they bill it as Joe Strummer and the 101ers at this point, but good recording. That, it's it's uh raw, but it's good. So that was just basic, you know, pub rock, which was which was uh you know, rock and roll, but it wasn't punk. And the 101ers got a gig where they, they were opening for this new band called the Sex Pistols that everybody was going nuts about. And he said 10 seconds into that Sex Pistols set, he realized that the 101ers were obsolete. He was like, oh, holy shit. And oh, so wow. um, Mick Jones and Paul Simonin um, were 
in art school together. Uh, Mick Jones uh, was a huge Mott the Hoople fan. He used to follow Mott the Hoople around on tour and hang out with them. Mott uh, is amazing. I recently uh, just, I you know, you go in circles with the stuff you listen to. And that first Mott album came up and I had to just, i am just been rocking them a lot lately. They're really good. Yeah, there's a lot of good old bands back then that didn't make the kind of the top 10 list like Zeppelin and The Who that are really good, you know? It almost like, makes them better because you're not hearing the same damn uh, hit over and over. Yeah. You, know? you can just you can just do some deep dives on some yeah. obscure shit. So, um, so Mick Jones, um, he was a lead guitarist in a proto-punk band called London SS. Um, okay. And uh, Paul Simonin, his pal from art school, tried out as the lead singer from London SS. They basically, they wanted Paul in the band because he looked like a rock star. You know, if um, any of them kind of had the classic kind of uh, rock star look, it was Paul. Um, so he, he tried out as the lead singer. Uh, Terry Chimes, who later played with The Clash, um, was um, in... Uh, uh, a drummer for London SS for a little bit. Right. Um, so um, London SS breaks up. Um, Malcolm McLaren had organized the Sex Pistols. He was basically the manager of Svengali but behind getting the Sex Pistols together. Um, and Bernie Rhodes decided he wanted to get his own uh, punk rock group together. And he kind of latched onto Mick Jones after London SS broke up and became Mick Jones' manager. Um, uh, they, um, he, he, he noticed that, um, Mick and, uh, Paul Simonin were good friends. So he recommends that Paul Simonin learns bass to join the new band. And so, um, I think Mick Jones tried to teach him guitar first and it just wasn't happening. So then he taught him bass cause it's a little simpler. Would, um, would you, would you say Kim Fowley and, and Malcolm McLaren were cut from the same cloth? Uh, yeah. Time? You know, Kim Fowley was a, a serious kind of Colonel Parker cut. Yeah. cut him, Except. Know. Yeah. So Kim Fowley, for those of you that don't know, is the, the guy that kind of got the runaways together. Another good yeah. uh, punk band, this an American all girl punk band that spawned Joan Jett and Lita Ford. But uh, Kim Fowley was a fucking douchebag. So that's the yeah. only difference. Malcolm well, McLaren, he was a manager, and aren't they all, you know? I... Yeah, Kim Fowley was a real douchebag. Yeah. There's, and I won't go into it, but he was a hardcore uh, douchebag. Um, but anyways, yeah, so you got those figures like Kim Fowley, Malcolm McLaren, and now Bernie Rhodes. They want, they have this, they want to get a group together. Um, yeah, the slap next the product and, and pimp it, you know, but yeah. yeah go ahead. Go but ahead. in the case of the Sex Pistols, it was very culturally relevant, and same with the Runaways, actually. And, um, but anyways, um, so you got Paul Simone and Mick Jones in this new, as yet unnamed group that Bernie Rhodes is organizing. Uh, next person recruited was Keith Levine, who get on uh, as the second guitar player. He actually, um didn't last long he was not showing up at rehearsals so mick jones told him to piss off he ended up being the guitar player in public image limited with john lyden oh, after after the sex pistols interesting broke up. um now he's so, selling fish and chips and uh trying to tell people about right i used to be in public image actually i don't know i know <laughs> <laughs> Go, i got my audience here. Got my chips. audience here laughing by the way, I used to. Image limited. That's great. Can I get a little extra vinegar on my fish yeah, and chips? I need some uh, H and L sauce. Now, Public Image Limited gets back together on the regular. I don't know if he's in those later versions, um, but anyways, uh, this is not a pill episode, so we'll keep going with the Clash. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, basically, uh, Mick Jones and Bernie Rhodes see. Uh, the 101ers might have been at that Sex Pistols concert where they opened for the Sex Pistols, and they're mm -hmm. struck by Joe Strummer's prowess as a singer and a frontman. And they're like, that's the cat we need in this band. 
Um, on that one on oneers release, there's some live stuff, and you do hear uh, just his energy. You you hear him becoming uh, the singer for the Clash. Uh, like he, he totally stands out from the type of music they're playing. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's no there's no other voice like Joe Strummer's. Yeah, know? but I mean, you can tell he's frustrated, and and it could just be him trying to just perform on stage but i like you were saying before on the music not quite you know where where a musician has to grow and and, and maybe branch out to a new sound uh i think some people miss the mark and like you look at the valentines or yeah, i was you know, thinking bon scott you bon were scott. That's exactly who i was thinking of when you were saying this Here. They're just over to the left, and if just yeah. pi, just get center, and now you're fucking ACDC. And yeah, you know. yeah. So yep. it took Bon Scott a while to. We'll do a Bon Scott episode at some point. It took him a while to hit his stride. So same thing yeah. with Joe Strummer. So um, uh. So Terry Chimes becomes the drummer, and and. You've got the lineup, the early lineup uh, with Terry Chimes on drums. Um, Simonin comes up with the band name. He sees the word The Clash in the newspaper somewhere, uh, or Clash in the headlines. Let's call the band The Clash. There was also a song called, uh, I think, 7 7 Clash um, by Culture, one of these uh, reggae bands they used to listen to. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me if I didn't get that exactly right, but uh, it was a. It was a in a song title of a, a, a band they used to listen to a lot. Um, mm -hmm. um, but apparently came from the newspaper, Paul Simone and came up with it. Um, so um, when Joe Strummer joined the clash, and this is me pulling the thread back to earlier in our conversation. And you said he was always just very harsh on music that came before punk rock. He felt self-conscious that he was not a punk rocker until he gets recruited into this punk band. Mm. And, and so then he becomes Joe Strummer, the punk rocker. And he apparently, uh, there's, a, there's a great uh, Joe Strummer documentary called The Future is Unwritten about him. Mm. And they get into this in detail. He had hippie friends. He just cut the fuck off. He joined the clash. And He's going to be 100% punk now. He started ignoring any friends that were hippies. And saying all that shit about the bands that came before, right? Yeah, yeah. And and part of it is that was so that's what was so great about punk rock. Sid Vicious used to walk around with a t shirt or Johnny Rotten, one of them, probably a bunch of them that said Pink Floyd sucks. And yeah, at the yeah. time you didn't say Pink Floyd sucks. This is oh, like yeah. right, right after Dark Side of the Moon comes out and they were it was rock Floyd. royalty. It was uh, yeah. uh and the the best thing with England is is Bob Marley had come over and recorded his uh, Catch a Fire and started his whole journey, and that was all right in England. And there's so much uh, reggae uh, or just Jamaican heritage music, roots music, uh, sprinkled throughout England, and uh, I love oh, yeah. I love that the Clash really took from from that um yeah instance. um the the um mick jones especially was just hardcore into into reggae and dub music and and we'll talk a lot well we'll be talking about that um but yeah that's what makes them unique you know you can't like the police and not like the clash and that's kind of where you were at one point and i'm like dude if you like this <laughs> yeah. if you like the sex pistols and you like the police the clash is right in between those. You might as well start listening. Well, and, and I tell you, my my last holdout was that when I heard the word punk music, yeah. I expected a certain thing. And then when you put on um, some of the more popular clash stuff, it was like, dude, this might as well be Blondie. You know, I just it just uh, it, and you know, and I liken it to me trying to sell Thin Lizzy to you. And mm -hmm. until you realize they weren't a thrash band, um, 
And it's exactly and, the same. It took me a while yeah. to get into Thin Lizzy for the same reason because it became more was, palatable when you realized. Every, oh, everybody okay. talked about their dual guitar attack, and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be uh, Judas Priest or yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. And, and they're a lot more mellow, but uh, they're mellow. Be, but that band, good God, I, I yeah, just, you accept you accept who they are and start appreciating it, and you get yeah, into it. Yeah. So, um. So uh, their first gig is on July 4th, 1976. Holy crap, right on the bicentennial. Except I was five were, years old. Good over God. in Sheffield, England. And um, Keith Levine is still on uh, second guitar at this point. Um, uh, Strummer, uh, basically, yeah, he dedicates himself to fully shedding his old ways. Um, on August... Uh, of 1976 about a month later a landmark event happened in england it, the ramones played in london for the first time and everybody was there there were cats from on oh, no, i think we mentioned this in the ramones episode but there were cats from all over uh, a, a bunch of people that ended up starting punk bands and um, i i, I want to correct something we we had the ramones episode last week and we were talking about how many gigs they played you know twenty two thousand gigs and i was like that that's a thousand shows a year it was actually I was, when i was listening to i was like they played three gigs a day yeah i, don't think so. <laughs> I i'm like i just i hilarious. hate when i screw up you know in the uh and even in the bosch episode i'm talking about how uh you know um Elmore Leonard, and it's actually James Elroy, is more uh, what Bosch uh, uh, emulated. You know. Well, I'm sure people were horrified when they heard that, and they're totally yeah. Relieved. Well, it's a it's now a we, you know no, misinformation. Just trying to correct where I can. Yeah, we can't get all this shit right. We just wrap it as we see it. So, um, so anyways, uh, not so long after that, that's when Keith Levine gets his walking papers. Um, uh, in December of that year, the Sex Pistols did a, a tour called the Anarchy Tour, and uh, the um, the Clash was on that tour. I think uh, Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers were on that tour. I think the Damned was on that tour. God damn, I want to go back in time and see that yeah, tour, see man. That. Fucking Sex Pistols, Clash, Heartbreakers. And the damned. I recently sent you a text on a, a, a time machine stop. I, I had the date and time and everything. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a remote yep. thing. Yep. So um uh it's around this time there's some riots and not uh the Notting Hill Carnival was basically it been going on since 1966, I think. It's this carnival um on bank holiday Monday, which is some you know fucked up English holiday. And um, it's all the Mediterranean, all the Caribbean uh, Rasta reggae cats in this big music festival. Well, the cops are out and forced to make sure there's no it will uh, have none of that. unruliness and yeah. tensions rise and and people end up throwing bottles at the cops. The cops start fighting uh, the crowd and a, a big riot breaks out. Well. Joe Strummer was at the uh, carnival, and I think I think it was Joe and Mick. I think Mick, it was Mick Jones and Joe Strummer, um, and they're at the carnival, and the riot breaks out, and they ended up rioting uh, uh, again, you know, against the police too. In that in that riot, there's a funny story in one of the documentaries about how they're trying to set an overturned car on fire, and they can't get it lit. Um, <laughs> But uh, so basically, um, Joe Strummer was inspired to write White Riot as uh, a call to action for white people to riot against injustice as well. Because there were like, there was probably 10 white people at this carnival with right, thousands of, right. of uh, Rastas. And um, so that, that song gets written. Um, it's released as a single in March of 1977. Uh, January of 77, they get signed to CBS Records. A lot of the punks in uh, England started saying they were sellouts and a lost cause because they signed to the evil corporation. 
Right. Um, uh, didn't seem to affect their music in the least. Um, they did get bossed around about what single they were going to release, I think, on an early album. But for the most part, it, they never had to record crap for the record company. Right. Um, well, their first two, uh, White Riot in 1977, I think, were their most uh, punk, uh, you know, in the punk genre style. Uh, oh, yeah. That, that whole first album is so good. Yeah, um, it's and loud and fast, baby. The U.S. version has like five or six songs that aren't on the U.K. version, so you almost have to buy both records, you know. Yeah, or just stream it on Spotify. It, I, yeah, yeah. Here's a little trick. If you're, if you're making a playlist on Spotify, this is what I do. I go to Wiki. I see the, I see the list of albums. I make the playlist of every album in that order. Then I sort the playlist by title. And that now it's listing every song on your playlist in alphabetical order. And whenever I see a repeat, I'll just go and delete the repeat out of that sequence. Then I put it back in custom order. You got all the albums in order now, but any repeated songs have been snipped down. That's a little pro tip for you, Cass. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, sometimes there's a demo over, you know, sometimes you'll hear something different. Oh yeah, if it's a demo version, but if it's like the UK the and the US release, song. and there's going to be four or five repeats on there, yeah. you just yeah. Wow. So um, so uh, they em- embark on the White Riot tour uh, in May of 1977. There was a big Rock Against Racism concert in '78. They play that. Um, uh, give them enough rope. The second album gets released in '78. Uh, um, uh, the producer on the, so the first album is really just capturing them live, their live sound. Mm. Uh, this, and it was recorded fast and loose, you know, um, like a lot of the best albums are. Yeah. Most people's first album is just, here we go. You know, that's. Yeah. So uh, the cat that uh, basically the record company says, um, and I think that first album initially you couldn't get it in the U.S. There wasn't even a U.S. version. Um, in the U.S., they released the second album first, which was um, uh, stupid because everybody, all the punks over here, knew who the Clash were. They were getting that first album via import, anyways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, the record company, you know, they're overthinking it. But anyway, so the second album. They're like, you know, that first album sounds a little too raw. We're going to bring in a producer. And they end up bringing in Sandy Perlman, who we talk about uh, the episode where we're interviewing Albert Bouchard, the drummer for Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, Sandy Perlman was there. You know, he co-wrote a ton of songs with them. He did some. Yeah, he he did some producing for Blue Oyster Cult. And he uh, sometimes did some management stuff. So Sandy Perlman was the the Svengali behind Blue Oyster Cult, and um, he comes in to produce the second Clash album. And for them, it was a little bit of a pain in the ass, not because he didn't make them record anything crappy, but they had to slow down and do like twenty bass takes and you know twenty guitar takes, and they felt right. like some of the spontaneity was taken out of that second album. I love it. I think it's a great album. It's still yeah. the Clash. It's still got a lot of that kind of OG punk rock vibe. Um, let's look at uh, let's really look at, with the Clash. The only the only time where you got to kind of step back a bit is I mean Santa Nisa. I think through yeah. some people, and um, that's because and we'll get to that. And that's not because of a lack of good songs. It's because of an extra edition of mediocre songs. Mm-hmm. But um, so first the first Clash album. Um, and this is just as li- listed in w- wiki so i'm assuming this is probably the the yeah this is the original uk version we'll just go with that janie jones remote control i'm so bored with the usa white riot hate and war what's my name deny london's burning career opportunities cheat protect tri- bleh, protects blue po- uh, cover of police and thieves which was that wow. that was a huge hit the original version at the time junior yeah Vermin, man oh they cover that while it's the original is already a, a hit 48 hours garage land the story behind garage land is uh some 
critic called them a mediocre garage band. So they write a song, you know, we're a garage band, we live in garage land or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, well, so they, really, that, they cover that Junior Mervin song almost, almost identical. It's, it's such a great uh, tribute. You know. It's a killer, yeah. And 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 when I hear that title, I obviously think of the Clash. You know, uh -huh. I'm much more close to the Clash than Junior Mervin, but uh, it's they just really make it their own. It's great. They do. Um, I right. had that Junior Mervin album um, back in back in high school. Uh, my dad's uh, roommate was a huge influence on me uh, musically, and he had that Junior Mervin album and played it a lot. I actually kind of got into um, Bob Marley because of the, you know, the same, uh, you know, influence. Um, yeah. We so got to do a trash cover that junior Mervin. I was like, Whoa, you know, and, and that they yeah. do it so well. Uh, it really, uh, I respected them a lot for that. We got to do a Marley episode at some point. Cause he is, He's right up there with Dylan and, and Lennon and McCartney, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. as far as so, just amazing. Not a bad album. Uh, those those 14 island release records yeah. are just stellar. Um, in the music industry, there's all these little pirate labels that'll reissue. They'll they'll take something, and if you don't know, you're gonna buy it up and be like, oh man, this is and and it's a poorly recorded version of a song that's actually on a, a legitimate release yeah so you have to if if you just look when you're buying bob marley if you look that it's on island records you're going to have a legitimate bob marley uh, yeah album. for the one or two of you out there who still buy physical music yeah so, yeah so uh uh give them enough rope it has safe european home english civil war tommy gun Julie's been working for the drug squad, last gang in town. Guns on the Roof, funny story behind that one, is um, uh, Paul Simonin. Uh, I think it's it's a couple guys from the band. I forget who, because all four of them wrote it. But a couple of them, they were, they were up on a roof somewhere, like an apartment building, and they had an air rifle, and there's, there's pigeons flying over, and they're taking pot shots at the pigeons. Okay. And, but they're um, shooting out into the neighborhood. Yeah, at these pigeons and the pigeon and um, it turns out they were like rare homing pigeons that were oh, owned man. by some rich dude who had a big yes. coop up on the neighboring building. Right. And um, uh, so eventually the cops come and they they cops came running at them and you know were like drop drop the guns, drop the guns. And I think by air rifle, I literally think it's like a pellet gun, you know, I mean, right. it's England. So I'm, I'm not sure what they could have got their hands on other than that. Um, but they were, they were treated as terrorists and, you know, I think they were taken down to the police station. So guns on the roof comes from that, that mm -hmm. story, drug stabbing time, stay free, cheap skates, all the young punks. Um, so another just solid album um, produced by Sandy, Sandy Perlman. And again, some people think it's a little overproduced, but I, I don't, I don't hear it. I think it's good. Um, well, one uh, thing I, before we get too far, um, yeah. the songs that were uh, on the U S version of their first album. Uh -huh. um, so they, they omitted uh, deny, cheat, protest, blue, forty-eight hours, and the original version of White Riot. Right. Uh, and so the U.S. version had Clash City Rockers, which is a great song. Uh, Complete Control, a re-recorded version of White Riot. So there's actually two versions of White Riot, and then mm -hmm. White Man in Hammersmith Palais. Uh, that was, um, and then I Fought the Law is a great cover. That yeah. that might be one of the first class songs I heard too, where they covered that I fought the law. Uh, that ended up on that Clash EP, Cost of Living, and then yeah. a great song called Jail Guitar Doors uh, was the B side to Clash City Rockers. But they just differences. They, they destroy I fought the law. I mean, they just kill mm -hmm. that song. It's great and a good in a good way. Um, white 
uh, White Man and Hammersmith Palais, Complete Control, and Clash City Rockers were all singles that they put out in between the first and second album in England. And so, yeah, so the record company, again, they don't release the, the first uh, album in the U.S. They released Give Him Enough Rope, um, and then they put out a bastardized version of the first album with all these killer extra songs included. So, um, again, my clash playlist, I just got all the songs, but, um, yeah, it's interesting how they, they used to do that. They, uh, well, it'll sell more than it in the U S if we do this yes, Isn't that I, early Beatles albums and early stones album. Yeah. It just makes, oh, makes the playlist a pain in the ass. Some of the stones albums are just, uh, specifically the stones. There's one album that every song was already on other things. And Mick doesn't even consider that an album. Yeah. Uh, where the US, they, they didn't know and they're snatching it up because it's the next one. Um, yeah. But, um, uh, you know, uh, The Clash, uh, that first album, you really need both versions because those songs are just so good. Yeah, you just go on Spotify, you make yeah. a complete playlist and then and sort it by it. title and delete the repeats and you're good to go so <laughs> anyways um london calling uh this one comes out uh in 1979 um the song london calling is a, a apocalyptic kind of uh uh diatribe um basically uh um joe strummer had been reading a lot of uh doomsday stuff and this might sound familiar to some of you because it's, you know, it's uh, uh, there's always a doomsday crowd. Everything's about to collapse, blah, blah, blah. And um, Joe Strummer had been reading a bunch of doomsday stuff about how there was going to be an ice age. It's in the in the song. Ice age is coming. Um, there's going to be an ice age because of pollution and uh, mm -hmm. society's going to collapse and it's all. And he was getting worked up and he actually wrote the song London Calling as a kind of a call to, call to arms about the impending apocalypse, you know, in 1979. And musically, there was an apocalypse coming out. It was called the 1980s. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, phony Beatlemania has bitten, has the, bitten dust. the dust. Yeah. Uh, um, another, another jab at a sacred relic of the hippie generation. Um, well, what what's what's interesting too is i don't know a lot of people are going to make the connection but the cover to london calling the lettering down the side and across the bottom uh is is exactly elvis presley's first release uh, yeah it was a they were they, green paint they, they down fucked, the side and green along the bottom they uh, fucked with all the icons of yesteryear and that right. was a total diss diss slash tribute they're there they had the balls it's like when the replacements named their album let it be mm -hmm. same kind of oh, thing I, yeah. you think they dissed elvis i've i mean i don't know I, what i'm saying is they were fucking with a sacred cow and they mm -hmm. knew it oh yeah totally. uh, they're, they're like just, we're gonna we're gonna I rip off as a, elvis as, a tribute, album as a tribute to it you know a nod to it uh yeah, I don't know. I think uh, it's an homage, and it's also just a brazen punk rock kind mm -hmm. of, you know, fuck it. Yeah, gonna... uh, th that's the thing with punk is, you know, you take the Ramones song, I'm Against It, and they just list everything that, that people like, and they go, I'm against it. Yeah. <laughs> and most people, what's what's humorous, we're, we're all guilty of it. If you start bashing something that I like, I'm like, oh, okay, you're one of those people. And I tend yeah. to just slowly turn your volume yeah. down where i don't hear yeah, you yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's such a punk thing is oh you like that yeah that's fucking dumb yeah, yeah. funny Beatlemania yeah. has bitten the dust yeah so um london calling uh the tracks on this one london calling brand new cadillac jimmy jays jimmy jazz i mean hateful rudy can't fail um Spanish bombs, the right profile, lost in the supermarket, clamp down, guns of Brixton. Paul Simonin wrote Guns of Brixton because he realized, you know, these cats are getting all these songwriting royalties. I better come up with something. And <sighs> it's a shame 
he writes and sings Guns of Brixton. It's one of their best songs. Oh, I love that song and so much. This, that motherfucker should have wrote more, man. He yeah. should have been doing and he so well. Sang more afterwards. because that song is yeah. just killer. Um, yeah, I, I really, I would love for Booger Cookie to cover uh, Guns of Brixton. Yeah, we covered 1977. Yeah, yeah. nobody touches our our yeah. version of that. Nope, nobody hears our stuff either. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyways, maybe we'll throw some links on the website at some point. We should do. A booger cookie episode. It's just an episode oh, wow. <laughs> on Jeez. the history of booger cookie. Yeah, we shouldn't. <laughs> That'd be I, our I, low, lowest already, rated episode ever. We already got to hear you re-sing Leafy Leafy. Let's let's leave some. <laughs> I was gonna sing uh, London's Burning tonight with my guitar and everything, but oh, I, I what was too much. I forgot. Um, I can I can rock a good. Uh, ramshackle rock version should, of London's Burning. Yeah, we we should pause and get you set up, and we'll. Uh, oh, nah, too uh, much work. Um, Wrong and Boyo, Death or Glory, Coca Cola, The Card Cheat, Lovers Rock, Four Horsemen, I'm Not Down, Revolution Rock, Train in Vain. So this is a double album. Back when <clears throat> albums came out on vinyl, this took two vinyl albums. Yeah, four it's a sides. great record though. God. Yeah, it's just amazing. And this is, I think, where they really, Mick Jones is bringing more and more of his reggae uh, uh, influence into the band. Um, and they're really just, they're, they're, they're being punk rock towards the punk scene. Like, oh, okay, you're saying we sold out? Well, fuck you. We don't have to just stick to your three chord fast and loud formula anymore. We're, we're going to do whatever the hell we want. And in a way, that's... And that's punk. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. punk right there. Um, yep. And so. these, there's not a bad song on this album. This in, is their Exile on Main Street, in my opinion. It's just a perfect double album. It's a double album because they had so many good songs. It would have been a sin to exclude any of them. And uh, it's just a killer, killer album. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think, I think if, if you're ready to go to the next one, um, it's oh. like Sandinista is their Use Your Illusion one and two, where it's too much. Too if much. You yeah, yeah. That down, you would have had a fucking, you know, epic record. Um, yeah. But the flip side is Sandinista, just if you take it song by song and you think, look at how diverse these guys are, instead of going, what the hell are they playing now? And you hate it uh it's it's actually it's one of those records where you might have hated it when you first got it but as you years go on and you, and you give it a shot it's it's just amazing that anybody uh most bands are just either they're just broke on one thing and it's a much healthier band that you you can throw whatever out and and the fans eat it up you know I do want to kind of say a little bit more about London Calling, um, but yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying about Sandinista. So it was produced by Guy Stevens, who also worked with The Who and The Stones in various capacities. Yeah. Um, the title track reached a number 11 in the UK and number uh, uh, the album reached number 9 in the UK and number 27 in the US. It was their first real commercial success in the US. So um the the uh, first two albums released in reverse order and bastardized track listings didn't really make a smash, um, but the this uh, this was their first kind of real commercial success. They tour the U.S. They add uh, Mick Gallagher on keyboards um, as a touring musician, and um, the album gets rave reviews, and they're kind of locked in as the top U.K. band at the time. Um, and then comes along Sandinista, as you said. Yeah, and you're you're absolutely right about Sandinista. Um, you made a killer playlist for this uh, episode called "A Riot of My Own," which we'll link from the website. Um, and the, what I really loved about it is you, because if you look at if you listen to the Clash in chronological order, they go from just white hot punk rock, classic traditional punk rock 
into um, this kind of reggae thing, and then they get into Sandinista, and they're kind of noodling around for three, three, uh, three albums. Yeah, uh, it's a three disc album or whatever. Um, and then they uh, come back with uh, Combat Rock, and that's a little, um, uh, a little more even, and it's more of a mixture of the styles. And then um, they break up, and then Joe Strummer records a solo album that he writes The Clash on that we're not going to really talk too much about. Uh, it's definitely not on the playlist. Um, and so um, what you did with your playlist is you just mixed it up, and, and it's a good sonic journey through The Clash. Yeah, yeah. And you, I, wanted, you know, you... I wanted to ping-pong back and forth yeah. in, in my mind as I made it and put it together. Um and by doing that, it actually took a while to put together. But um, by the end, I've really, I was like, man, this is. Uh, it's killer. It's so cool. you're listening to something real mellow off of Sandinista. And then, you know, Clash City Rockers is the next tune. It's yeah. it really found. But the thing I noticed about it, I was looking at it and I was like, there's just as many songs off of Sandinista on this playlist as there is the other albums. But. Santa Anissa was a three, uh, a triple album. So while the other albums, there may be five songs that aren't on there on the playlist from Santa Anissa, there's another 20 songs that aren't on the playlist because <laughs> they don't make the playlist because they yeah. just put everything on there. And oh, they, t- yeah. they talk about that in one of the documentaries, you know, uh, uh, Topper would show up. So, so, Somewhere along the way here, by the way, Terry Chimes leaves the band and Topper Heaton uh, or Topper Hedden, um, however you pronounce it, becomes the drummer. And mm-hmm. Topper, the interesting thing about him is he was actually a well-trained jazz musician and he was a multi-instrumentalist. And apparently he could play guitar and bass better than anybody else in the band. He was the drummer and he was a fantastic drummer. He's the guy who basically wrote Rock the Casbah. He came up with the whole song structure and the other guys added stuff mm-hmm. right before he left the band. And we'll get to that. But um, Topper would wander in and start noodling on the piano or on the drums. And then um, uh, maybe uh, Mick Gallagher, who was the keyboardist, would come in uh, and, and no- start noodling on something. And the other guys would come in and go, what, what were you noodling on while we were out getting stoned or whatever they were doing? Mm-hmm. And they would play it back and the other guys would just add some stuff and then just slap it on the album. I mean, they weren't filtering anything out. They're just right. whatever ideas they come up with. it. And and again, I have that complete album on my, my Clash playlist. I've got the whole thing on there whenever I whenever it's time to do my complete uh, Clash listen, which is once every month or two yeah i listened to it all and there's a lot of great stuff on there man police on my back um one more time yeah Um, straight to hell is just phenomenal straight to hell is off the combat rock but it it sounds like yeah it sounds like sandinista it does i I always put it on there that's funny yeah but um it uh it basically um you're right it's it's a real mixed bag um um, and it's almost because they mixed. almost they, too mixed and yeah. and just like use your illusion one and two uh maybe you got 30 songs you can pull 12 out of that whole uh squirrel's yeah. nest and then you've got a really solid record yeah Matt, let's see the good i'm not going to read every song off this album but the good stuff magnificent seven um ivan meets gi joe's pretty good um somebody got murdered one more time one more time dub the dub version of one more time yeah, lightning you. strikes is kind of a riff off of uh off of magnificent seven um police on my back is just the eddie grant tune that they uh cover is just phenomenal they really make that their own um charlie don't surf is good junkie slip yeah, I mean, and there's so there's a handful of good tunes on there, and I'm probably missing some. You could definitely get a, a solid single album, maybe even a double album, but triple album. It's just too much, man. It, it is. You look hard. in one sitting, it's just too much. But um, on random, this the different styles uh, from disco to 
gospel to reggae. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, a lot yeah. of bands don't have the balls to even attempt that. Um, yeah, yeah. So I do give them, uh, I kind of give them a, a pass and allow it. Um, it. It's just a classic record. In 1980, when everything was so cut and it had to be this or that, at 1980, yeah. they, they're they're blowing you out of the water with this thing. Um, 1980 yeah. was pretty close minded. It had to it had to be this or that or this. You know, there was no people. Just I don't think people were really uh, nowadays. I think people are into so many different styles. They're actually um, hit with so many different music. Being able to just jump on the internet. Uh, where back then, 1980, you turn the radio on, you heard one thing on that radio station, you had to, you had to switch over to two stations to hear uh, some other genre. So, you know, it was very easy to be locked into one sound, and that's all you listened to, you know. Yeah. They also, um, I think, with this album, it's interesting because, again... 1980s mainstream culture if you live through it it was just fucking garbage and yeah. it was um it was very much cut and dry um and there were there definitely were parameters around all the genres of music the new wave kids at high school hanged out over here the the, the metal kids would hang out over here yeah. and um, then the outcasts kind of drift between yeah, yeah. The yeah. different groups the punk uh, kids were a totally separate group from the new yeah. wave and the metal yeah. kids it was, and so um, for the Clash to break into the mainstream with London Calling, and then follow it up with a big "fuck you" to you and your categories and your fucking, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, they uh, with, with Sandinista. They almost purposely, yeah, we're gonna throw a disco tune in here now. Fuck right, you. right. That's so punk. It you can't, you can't get any punker. Unless well, they were like Didi Ramon's uh, ripped up jeans, you know. I thought you were going to say D.D. Ramon's rap album. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty punk, yeah. But uh, Magnificent Seven actually um, is influenced by hip-hop. That's their rap song. You know, they were totally into it. They they came to New York uh, when they toured for London Calling, and they were like, oh, this hip-hop stuff's killer. We're going to put the, we're going to do a hip-hop yeah. song. And that, that says a lot, though, because at the time, again, 1980, if you were white, you listened to this if you were yeah. black, you listened to that. It, yeah, you did not. It really was different. Did not, yeah, I, you know. So I love. I. That's why I uh, continue to praise San Anisa just for yeah. the diversity. And they also uh, started collaborating with some interesting cats. Mikey Dread is on this album. He's a, mm -hmm. a, a dub artist. He has a I kill. It's Mickey. I think it's Mickey, but go ahead. No, it's Mikey. Is it? Okay. Yeah. He um he um he uh, has a killer album called Dread at the Controls if if you want to check that out, but he's uh he he co-writes one more time and one more time dub and if music could talk, and really starts bringing the dub into their sound you know and not just the reggae but the you know and I'll do that for another hour and that's dub wow yeah um, yeah. Um, I was about to so, start recording. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's Sandinista. It, when it came out, it, the reviews were mixed. I think the sales, uh, the sales were kind of mixed. Um, let's see what I what I have here in my notes on uh, Sandinista as far as yeah, it's just a mixed bag. Um, uh, do you want to you want to move on to Combat Rock or you have yeah, anything else? Yeah, yeah, I think we. We've drilled San Anisa right in the ass. Let's keep it. <laughs> we've we basically tag team that that one yeah. till it's yeah. <laughs> Two in the mouth and one of them is pretty tired, pretty yeah. tired, worn out, gaping. To dry. <laughs> All right, no throwing stuff. <laughs> I'm getting the peanut galleries throwing stuff at me. Um, so uh, Combat Rock uh, comes out in '82, uh, and again that album just blew the fuck up. And, yeah, uh, that's a return to four and their breakout, really sadly. Uh, they they break out with that, and then that was really the swan song. Yeah, so um, uh, 
Um, Rock the Casbah, like I said, it was all over the airwaves. Should I stay or should I go was a top 10 hit in the U.S., and um, I, I felt that was just punk as you, you know, that was just yeah. great. And there was a, but there was a musical friction happening within the band at this point. And you can hear it in the album. Mick Jones thought Santa Nista was a great album and he mm-hmm. wanted to do further, more experimental shit. Um, he was a big pothead. He would show up late for rehearsals uh-huh. and, and he just started bringing them more and more far out material mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. And um, Paul Simonin and Joe Strummer want to go back to a more uh, uh, heavy punk uh, sound. And you can and they, hear it. You they can really hear it. should have. It should have been two more yeah. just raw can, punk albums. You can hear this uh, clash, no pun intended, uh, of styles in Combat Rock. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the track listing. You've got Know Your Rights, you know, uh, Strummer and Jones wrote that. And, and musically, it's more along the lines of something from Santa Nista, car jamming, same thing. Should I stay or should I go? Mick Jones ironically wrote that, but it's got that heavy kind of punk uh, thing. Rock the Casbah was really Topper, uh, topper Heading's baby, um, but Jones and Strummer added to it. Red Angel Dragnet, Straight to Hell, could be right off of Santa Nista. Uh, just that that's my fa- i think that's my uh one of my favorite class songs i, I would have really? to if if i had to list my f- first choice for the class would be um uh guns of brixton but uh yeah and, and it's just straight to hell it's killer um and then um uh let's see here hold on a second where was i yeah, so then Overpowered by Funk, which is uh, written by Joe Strummer and a graffiti artist slash hip-hop cat named Futura 2000. Um, they also did a song together called Futura 2000, which is him rapping, uh, kind of corny little rap about graffiti while the Clash play in the background. That's a kind of a bonus track. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, Overpowered by Funk, that could be right out of Santa Nista, Adam Tan. Sean Flynn, Ghetto Defendant with Allen Ginsberg uh, rambling on there. Totally something that could have been a Santa Nista. Mm. Inoculated City, Death is a Star. So it's a mix. But I think they uh, with that album, they achieve a good balance of, you know, you get a kind of funky reggae experimental tune and then just a heavy it's, hitting punk rock tune. To me, kind that of- album that album is very similar. Uh, I can, in my mind, I compare it to Kiss's uh, "Rock and Roll Over," where it's their purest, cohesive record uh, that stamps who they are. Um, uh, yeah, I would say that. I mean, the totally different just, styles, but as far oh, as yeah, no, but just just it captures who that band is. Yeah, and all these other albums are great, but this is the one that really captures uh, the essence of the band. Moment. Yeah, yeah that that one in London call. Yeah, yeah, because London Calling is one side of them, and yeah. then and then the Clash and Giving Them Enough Rope is another side of them, and then Combat Rock, rock is both sides. Yeah, uh, mixed together. So I, I, I love the title. Uh, the covers, like, hey, here, you know, they're all together. Uh, yeah, sort of like the first record. It just drummer goes, sporting a mohawk. You know, full circle. It's it's just yeah. so good, and yeah. a, a shame that. Um, Basically, everybody leaves the band, and Joe Strummer does cut the crap. Well, what we got, we got some shit happened in between those two events. Yeah, let me, let me. Yeah, uh, go ahead. All right, so um, Combat Rock just blows the fuck up. Um, uh, Topper Hedden writes the big hit single, uh, one of the big hit singles. Mick Jones writes the other. <laughs> um. And um, it just blows the fuck up. But Topper was basically just spiraling into a heroin addiction. Oh. And yeah, as uh, as uh, one of those one of the band members said in one of these documentaries I was watching said, um, a saxophone player like Charlie Parker can kind of skate by while they're addicted to heroin because you're kind of floating over the music. Mm. But a drummer has got to have their shit locked down. On yeah. You can't be on heroin and expect to be able to keep a beat. And he was just falling apart. 
it, it's it's so upsetting as a music uh, fan. I, if if you took music out of my life, I would have died years ago. Oh, I'd have shot. I, I'd have blown my head off. I'd be Wait. in prison for killing somebody. <laughs> I mean, the music has kept me anchored to uh, some semblance of of uh, normalcy, and it, it just it always um, it just knocks you back a step whenever somebody is just so uh, good at their instrument, their purity, their love of music, and then they're, 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 they become a junkie instead of a musician, it just pisses you off because there's, for every, um, for every John Bonham that dies of alcohol abuse, there's 10 drummers that we would all know uh, their names and who they, you know, they were that good but they never got a chance. And here, uh, you know, your Bon Scotts and, and John Bonhams and these all these amazing uh, musicians, they get the chance and they piss it away. And, and, and the guy that, that gets on heroin, I, I'm just like, God damn, man, really? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. It's, it's frustrating to see that happen, you know. It just, um, it angers you, you know? Yeah, it must be tough being a big, important, rich rock star. I'm just saying, yeah, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I go to work and work my, at, but yeah. my Friday, I come home and it takes me two days just to feel like I can move right again, yeah. uh, you know? <laughs> uh, and yeah. these cocksuckers are doing heroin. I, yeah, like, I damn, know. bro. God damn um, So he was one of those guys, threw it away, um, didn't OD, but he basically chat he basically just uh um uh screwed the the clash over they bring back terry chimes on drums um they open for the who uh at shea stadium that's the nice. combat rock tour yeah um um they that's dangerous finally, for the who uh because the class were on fire then you know yeah oh yeah that's Maybe. like uh it's like black sabbath taking van halen out you yeah, know but... what the fuck are you doing the who was so the who hadn't really jumped the shark i mean they're pretty still pretty good with kenny jones on drums and yeah. I, too they were still a force um but uh they did they certainly weren't looking for uh an easy opener when they brought the clash and they knew what they were getting into yeah yeah and uh um, legendary concert there's a live album of that um um and then the final gig uh for the clash the the real clash is um, cause I think, I, I, I think the, the Joe Strummer's lineup for the next album might've toured. I don't remember, but the final gig um, for all intents and purposes is um, uh, um, the S festival. And they oh, go out, yeah. Yeah. they play the S festival um, by this time. Like Paul Simone is not talking to Mick Jones. Paul would, if he wanted to say something to Mick, he would tell Joe Strummer, and Joe Strummer would tell Mick, and then Mick would reply by telling Joe Strummer, and Joe Strummer would tell Paul. So it's just, you know, stupid band dynamics like that. Yeah. Um, and Mick just got tired of Joe. Of I mean, Joe just Joe basically got. And and the other thing is, uh, Mick Jones was just increasingly not getting along with. Uh, Bernie Rhodes. Bernie, there was a period there in between the, when the band launched and now in this timeline where uh, they fired Bernie Rhodes and they just had a kind of management, a professional management group that managed them. Right. And they actually preferred that. But Joe Strummer and Paul Simone, and eventually they wanted Bernie back. They bring him back. Um, it was Bernie's idea to do that clash on Broadway thing where they did a, a residency at a club out in New York, which brought him a lot of publicity. He had, he had good ideas, but he just, he wasn't getting along with Mick. He was pushing the band in a dir direction musically that Mick didn't like. Um, and uh, Joe Strummer was tired of Mick always. He was a, basically a pothead. He would always show up late. Finally, Joe, um, uh joe basically uh tells um uh tells mick that uh you know you're out of the band this is 1983 
Mm-hmm. Mick looks over at Paul Simone and says, do you feel the same way? And he says, yep. And so he's gone. Um, Bernie Rhodes comes in and starts collaborating on songwriting for this next album called cut ironically titled cut the crap. Um, and every song on there, the songwriting credit says Rhodes strummer, right? So the manager, Simone and Simone is in the band, but he's not on the album. He's not. No, it's literally just Joe strummer. And, and I uh, don't think. Oh, hold on. Let me look. Let's let's verify. So you got Joe Strummer and Nick Shepard, Vince White, but then Pete Howard and Paul Simone and do, do not feature on the album. All right, hold on. Give me a minute. And so uh, this album, Cut the Crap, um, uh, Strummer does a great. There's like three really lead off singles from it. Uh, this is England, Dirty Punk, and Three Card Trick. Uh, those are decent songs. Um, to me, you know, somebody takes a bad photo, and they're like, "Oh, don't don't show that picture. I look terrible in it." Um, that's how you looked in that moment, you know. And and I do kind of short sheet this record because it's just Joe Strummer. It's, it's like a, it's a Joe it's Strummer like, solo album. It's with a Joe Nick Strummer solo album. It's like Tony Iommi. <laughs> And it's called exactly. Black Sabbath, but yeah. he's the only one in the band. It's like, shut up, man. That's exactly what it is. And and oh. so the personnel, you've got Joe Strummer on guitar and vocals. You got somebody, some fucking hired jackass named Nick Shepard. He brought in like three extra people, some additional yeah. musicians. So the, wait, the, I want to the... go through this. So Nick okay. Shepard on guitar and lead vocals. Another hired jackass named Vince White. And then um, uh, I guess Pete Howard was their drummer, but he didn't feature on the album. And again, Paul Simonin didn't play on the album. That's insane. Yeah, Somebody... so they brought in uh, session guys to, you yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, some synthesizer player, drum machine programmer, and uh, some some session bass player. And uh, Bernie Rhodes produced the album, credited as Jose Unidos, but it was Bernie Rhodes producing Bernie Rhodes co-writing. So we basically get to hear what Bernie Rhodes would have sounded like if Bernie Rhodes were Yeah, this is basically a Bernie Rhodes solo album with Joe Strummer singing. Um, I can't make it through it. I've tried a couple times. I cannot get all the way through it. I have to just stop listening to it. I I will say those three songs I rattled off, This Is England, Three Card Trick, and um, Dirty Punk, Uh, We Are The Clash is another decent tune on there. Um, In like on random they'll come on and you'll oh this is from cut the crap um mainly it it was the one album that's never uh mentioned but it's the sixth clash record and so i had to track it down and um well you're track, a completionist i know how you well, personally well you just want to hear well why are they so embarrassed by this um but the the bonus track a lot of times uh for the japanese market uh, there's a song on, on the Japanese version that's not anywhere else. And a lot of times it's the best damn song. There's a song called Do It Now that I think is uh, the strongest song of the 12. Um, and and- I, as Joe Strummer proved in his solo career, you know, when he got that band, the Mescaleros together uh-huh. behind him, yeah, those yeah. are solid albums. So yeah. Joe Strummer can write some great solo songs. And that's what the songs you just mentioned are really good Joe Strummer solo yeah. songs. Yeah. And what uh, I will probably do is add those songs to my Joe Strummer playlist, but I'm not going to ever add them to my Clash playlist because <laughs> this is not the fucking Clash. Yeah. And, I, and I'll and never add that whole album to anything because I can't make it all the nah. way through it. Um, and that Japanese uh, song, Do It Now, you can only get it if you have the CD. It's not even in the streaming stuff. Oh, but damn. I... I just dig the shit out of that song, and it it could totally be my collector. Uh, oh yeah, it, or, it is. But the no good one's thing heard this. Like, I need this song, and now I like it. Yeah. I I don't know. No, but it it's these, you have that completionist personality. But the good thing about that is you find the hidden gems. You know what I mean? Yeah, you yeah. find the shit that oh, this is a good song, even though it's. You know, it's not the full Clash lineup. I I get halfway through that album and I just check out. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, but I will. I'll probably track down the songs you mentioned and add them to my Joe Strummer playlist. Yeah, I mean, um, check them out. You might hate it. Um, I think they're decent Joe Strummer performances. Um, yeah, and he's, um, he's a good musician. Yeah, it's it's basically a Joe Strummer solo record, much like um, Tear and uh, Headless Cross. When you start looking at Black Sabbath. Uh, seven Tony, star Tony Iommi solo should, records. All every one of those should have been Tony Iommi solo records. Yeah, I think they'd be far better received if Cut the Crap was Joe Strummer's first uh solo re- record. We might actually be talking about oh man, uh, you know, instead of oh, it's a uh, you know, it's the no, I still wouldn't be able to make it all the way through. I'd be like, oh, you no, know, but you'd at least go, yeah, you know, there's some good songs here and there, you know, yeah. instead of sad, it's not the class. I, I literally, though, just can't make it through because of the quality of the music. It's just mm-hmm. it's, the it's the mid 80s, it's the mid 80s. It was overproduced, no man, drum machines, synthesizers. Yeah. The anyway, 80s has a decade to put music out. If you weren't listening to thrash, you, it yeah. was over. Or or Husker Du or you know yeah. Yeah. Underground Minutemen. If it yeah. wasn't that kind of shit, or 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 Exodus and yeah, and Thrash and, Clash or or you know Kiss My Ass. Yeah, <laughs> it's just oh. Thrash Clash or Kiss My Ass when it yeah, comes. Yeah, I mean, to it just what did you have? You had Madonna. You had you know. I guess the hip hop thing was huge in the eighties and that, that would have been where you would have gone, but you had some um, crappy hip hop. You know, too. We were 14 and close. We were only listening to what uh, the, the music industry said, okay, the white, the white uh, right. early teen uh, is going to listen to this. And this is where yeah. I shove down his throat. And yeah. okay, here's the guy over here. We're going to make him listen to, you yeah. know, so we, we were victims of what they dealt out yeah i mean you listen to you you know you were if you were a white kid in in the 80s and you listen in atlanta you listen to 96 rock you uh you know your black friends were listening to v103 which was the soul station and there was there was it literally nothing else yeah um but it's interesting so anyways so um cut the crap comes out um savage reviews people were saying the clash have cut an album of crap (laughs) basically served it up to the to the critics to just trash it um after the album failed i and i have a vague memory i'm not sure if they toured or not i think i have a vague memory of them coming to the fox theater on this tour as a five piece um but i'll have to look it up uh I'm going to find out. Hold on a second. I've got a little AI thing. I'm going to ask about whether they toured for that. Cause I've got a vague recollection of reading a newspaper article about the clash live up to their name. Cause they're all fighting each other. And a five piece version is coming to the Fox theater. Did the clash. Tour for the album. Cut the crap. in 1985 sure they they did but i don't let's know let's find out i just remember they did yeah mid late 80s you just heard all the classes broken yeah. up and and um you know you were caught up in so many other bands by that point i was heavy into uh master of puppets in 85 when cut the crap came out so i never would have even glanced at this record yeah. I I apparently they did tour, um, uh, but the tour finished before the album was released, which is you know Motorhead did that with um, uh, Iron Fist. Uh, they were touring before the album came out. Um, apparently they were performing "This Is England" uh, on that tour. Yeah. Um, that's probably the tour where that five piece version of the Clash came to the Fox Theater in Atlanta. I remember reading about that at the time. Uh-huh. Um, Anyways, um, so uh, uh, it, that that album, you know, basically just got savaged by the critics, um, rightly so, in my opinion. Um, uh, and there's, I think it's in the future is an written documentary about Joe Strummer, but basically, when that album failed, and Joe Strummer came to the realization that 
Um, Mick was right about Bernie. Bernie was a control freak. He was pushing them in the wrong direction. Uh Um, And, and then Mick Jones, basically his talent as an arranger, he was a songwriter and a guitar player, but he's also a really good arranger, but kind of like Keith Richards or Duke Ellington, he would basically uh, arrange these songs uh, and, and, and conduct or direct the band. Sure. And um, that, that uh, talent was missing from the band after Mick Jones was kicked out. Not to mention that he wrote and sang some of their best songs. Um, uh, yeah, it's a shame at that point that you don't go, man, I want to keep this rolling. Let me get on the phone and swallow some pride and, and call he, somebody. He, he did. It's the story I'm about to tell. Yeah. Okay. It's, so um, Joe Strummer d- decides oh my god he wakes up and he's like oh my god i can't believe i did this mm. i gotta get mick back in the band we've got to get the 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 core band back together um he calls mick nobody's answering he finds out mick went on a trip to jamaica and this is before smartphones you couldn't just text your friend yeah. and say, hey man i'm flying to kingston let's go grab a beer yeah, right. They had no idea where the fuck Mick was. Nobody knew. They just knew Mick's friends just knew he flew to Jamaica. He's on vacation. He'll be back in, you know, a few mm-hmm. weeks or something. Joe Strummer flies to Jamaica and just starts driving around. They've been to Jamaica together before, so I'm sure. assuming he's going to the recording studio they went to. Driving wow. around Jamaica looking for Mick Jones to try to get the clash back together. And Never finds him. He's there for, I don't know, a week looking for Mick Jones. Doesn't find him. Flies back to England. Later uh, later on, when Mick Jones comes back, he does get in touch with him. But Mick had already started his band, Big, Big Audio Dynamite. Um, I never dug them at all. Yeah, it's it's like cut the crap. I've tried never to get into them, and it doesn't. They've got one song that they released in the early 90s called Rush, which is a good tune. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Rush to the change of that. Yeah, that was the one, everybody. But I, I was like, yeah, I like I that tune, and it, it inspired me to try to marathon all their shit, and I just couldn't do it. It's just yeah. not there. And, yeah. but anyways, Mick was, Mick was, he had his own band, Big Audio Dynamite. He was calling the shots. He wasn't about to go back to the Clash and argue with Joe Strummer anymore. Right. And so it just it didn't happen. Um well and, and you look at how brilliant Queen was and it was all based on those arguments. And so you know, if if somebody well, I I could creative really, tension. If somebody creative listened tension. to Freddie Mercury's solo records. Oh my god, garbage. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking garbage. Holy fuck, bro. Yeah. You don't have oh, Brian May there laying down the killer riffs, man. Your yeah, operatic I mean, voice. You need, gonna, you cannot, you cannot yeah. surround yourself with a bunch of yes people. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yes. At, yes. Aside, right. aside from the one album that Rick Rubin produced, look at Mick Jagger's solo albums. Yeah. Uh, Water Spirit is a great record. That was, And the rest record. of them suck. And and you don't oh. you don't have someone like either Rick Rubin or Keith Richards there to keep you in check. Yeah, I, I mean, work. especially if you're if you're some flighty diva singer. Yeah, a la Mick Jagger or yeah. uh, obviously uh, Freddie Mercury. Yeah, um, you you're just gonna create uh, something on a whole other level that people are like, God, God, this is terrible. Uh, yeah. You, you don't have somebody there to ground you. Same yeah. thing, in my opinion, you look at Sting's solo albums versus when he's playing with the police. You don't got oh, Stuart God. Copeland there fucking rocking a good beat. You're just yeah. going to be meandering and singing, you know, yeah. what the yeah, fuck are uh, you doing? Um, Sting had one solo album called Ten Summoner's Tales. And for some reason, that... Uh, when I worked at Tower that had come out and it played. And for some reason, I really dug the shit out of that record, but I don't own it. I haven't heard it since, but I remember being really surprised by that record. And that could certainly be because of whoever the producer was. You know, mm-hmm. um, I've tried 
I've tried getting into his solo stuff. Oh, yeah, the, just... the Blue Turtle or whatever, all that crap. I, yeah. But uh, Ten Summoner's Tales, that was, I, I that just sticks out in my memory. I, I know that I'll, was. I'll give that one a listen, see if it's any good. Check but, it out uh, and definitely let me know if, it, if I'm an idiot. But uh, that. Stuart Copeland rocked a tasty beat, man. And you take that away and sting songwriting. And Andy Summers brought some heavy ass guitar throughout. Yeah, the, you know, and, at least and, you know, I, they're certainly worthy of a of an episode. I, so, I'm, so I'm right, no oh, we'll do, There's so many other bands. We will totally fucking do a police episode. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But um, if you if you surround Sting with a bunch of fucking jazz session musicians, it's just not going to be the same. So yeah. um, so anyways um. Uh, Strummer goes on to act in uh, several movies, contributes to some soundtrack songs. Um, they actually did a movie called Straight to Hell. Yeah, yeah, that was Great. a good, a good flick. Alex Trippy, Cox, weird, same weird. cat that did uh, Sid and Nancy. Yeah, yeah, and Repo Man, same guy. Yeah. Repo Man. Oh, yeah. so um, um, there a couple brief reunions at the Rock Hall of Fame induction in two thousand three. And there's some club that the two of them, Mick Jones and and uh, uh, Joe Strummer, played at. Um, I forget. It's in one of those documentaries. I think it's in the future is unwritten. They played together. It's a goddamn tragedy that they did. They did not. Uh, hey, you know when when that when that tour when you get off tour, let's let's do a just a solid uh, thirty minute punk riffage. Uh, classic clash you know uh, it would have been it would have been nice at the same the time you, know, more. you got the beatles and you got the stones the beatles have the the neat a to z career but clear mm -hmm. beginning clear end you got yeah. the stones they stuck around we all got to see them they released some good albums later on but there's also just a lot of kind of junk there especially after tattoo you where it's like well, it's, they're just going they're riding the wave of what they've done and yeah. uh, i will say they have not done anything so unforgivable uh they certainly could have um, yeah the way mick tends to want to just do a damn dance disco record i, I yeah. really don't understand it um thank god we have keith richards to just uh wear that uh you know the cowbell of blues music and the purity. Yeah. Well, of Mick wants to be Mick wants to be popular, so he's you know yeah. he's got record executives whispering in his ear all the time. Yeah. That's why he yeah. did the solo career. When we do our Stones episode, we'll talk. We can talk about that. But yeah. he was told if you go solo, you'll be as big as Michael Jackson. You know, and it didn't work. Yeah, um, let's work. Yeah, let's work. Let's I'm gonna work. come home and listen to Mick Jagger singing "Let's Work" on a yeah. Friday night. After. I don't know that Mick Jagger's ever worked, so let's you know. <laughs> yeah. leave that Anyways, away. um, Joe Strummer dies suddenly of an undiagnosed congenital heart defect in uh, um, 2002. Um, so actually, I don't know if the the Rock Hall induction was uh reunion included Joe Strummer because that was 2003. According to my notes, I'm not sure. But anyways, they did do, uh, I think it's in the future as unwritten, shows them doing a club uh, reunion, Mick and uh, Joe. Joe dies in the early 2000s. I remember when that happened. Fucking sucks. Everybody was kicking off around then. Joey Ramone, yeah. fucking Dee Dee Ramone, Johnny Ramone. Uh, it's Joe it's amazing that, that the entire Ramones uh, riddled with cancer and, and drug Strong. ODs. Yeah. Uh, sucks but. so they were um obviously one of the most uh influential bands in history uh somebody at cbs records um uh a guy named gary lucas he was a musician that worked at the label but he was in their creative services department came up with the logo uh, the the tagline the only band that matters um tagline manufactured by cbs records but it really fucking sticks you know the class For them, yeah i I, yeah. I always as soon as they say it i think about 50 other band but you know it's fine they can i know but it's part of their kind of bravado and myth making yeah. you know we're gonna steal Alva, elvis's album cover we're gonna be the only band that matters 
and yeah. in the 1980s well, it's, it's like it's like the kiss logo the the hottest band in the world it's like yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. um <laughs> especially now but anyways um <laughs> so uh yeah so um and they inspired tons of other bands i mean the, one of my favorite bands basically copped their entire sound and 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 heavied it up a bit rancid rancid I yeah mean, rancid is rancid is basically the clashes you know they're they're direct top muse the yeah, main heroin they inject into their veins is is clash music and you can tell and they yeah. fucking pump it up with some amazing bait uh matt freeman's bass playing and really good songwriting we'll do a rancid episode at some point when, when the clash when the clash is really on uh they are they to me they i always kind of think of i compare them to van halen with dave where it's just good time rock and roll music uh both when they're when they're on it's just white hot and and it's very similar to me is is the class is just good uh good time uh everybody's partying or you know you're with friends and you put that on and it's just a, it just really makes it a party uh same with those van halen records those six uh with dave yeah just it's flawless and and just fun just fun rock and roll and that's that's the clash for me it's funny though you mentioning those two bands i remember uh, David Lee Roth quote because the clash the other side of them we haven't touched on much because it's uh, not something you and I really uh, uh, spend too much time obsessing about is the political side and um, they were very much uh, you know for certain causes and and uh, mm -hmm. um, they had a message but the message never overpowered the artistry they were yeah. they were poets mm -hmm. first and foremost and so regardless of your views you could uh, relate to the music because it's just great music. But uh, David, David Lee Roth said, um, yeah, he goes, the clash may be right. The world may be a cesspool of pain and, and suffering, but at least we're sailing a yacht through it, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I love Dave for that shit. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the political stuff um, you tend to, uh, if you're if you're a rock band, you're only going to reach your fans. So if your fans are of the same ilk, and you're preaching some, uh, you know, we got to save the the Tibetan fruit bat, <laughs> they get it. They're already they're you're preaching to the choir. You're yeah. not going to reach the guy that's actively killing the Tibetan fruit bat. Yeah. So why not just it's, well it's just an inflated ego over importance a lot of yes. these artists get they think that I'm they just, can tell people it, what to think but the, you the, know when when the, when the bob dylan saying a time is going to change that's a that's a real like hey man stop stop hating these people you know that i get it that's but, that's a worthy but thing here's but. the difference here's the difference and my favorite example of a band that does not do this well is Rage Against the Machine, in my opinion. They have great guitar riffs, yeah. but there's nothing poetic about them beating you over the head with some message no. over, over, that they don't even adhere to. They record for no, what is it, Epic or Sony, big corporation. Yeah, and and they're, want, they're driving around in, in million dollar vehicles. Yeah, and, you want somebody who adheres to the message, go listen to fucking Fugazi. That's a yeah. fucking phenomenal band, and they walk what they talk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Rage yeah. Against the Machine is a fake version of Fagazi, and their lyrics just beat you over the head. There's nothing poetic. Yeah. Bob Dylan is a master poet. Joe Strummer and Mick Jones and Paul Simonin, when he bothered to write a song, master poets. Yeah. And and so there 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 is uh, they are engaged with the world and with with issues and and whatnot, yeah. but they do it in a very artistic way that anyone can appreciate. Yeah, but when you and, start and rage, rage was the, when they're great. Again, the, when they're great, they're great. Uh, but there's only so much of that De La Rocca shit you can take, where you're like, God damn, dude, you're you're, you're up why, in front why don't of. Why you retire to your take? Get in your Porsche, drive. Well, he to left your... the band. He left the band. To, you know, he's gonna 
he's going to shatter the world with his solo wreck. I don't think one's come out. I don't, I don't know what he's done. But, but, you know, get, get in your Porsche, drive to your yacht and go sail out in the middle yeah. of the ocean and just relax yeah. a little bit. S wipe your sweat down with some thousand dollar bills yeah. and yeah. sip on a martini and shut the fuck up. I don't yeah. want to hear yeah. it. Him Unless and Eddie Vedder, you know. <laughs> right. Eddie Vedder's another. But anyways, oh. um, that's a wonderful thing about The Clash is, you know, they they um, they did it with style. They did it with poetry. and Short, sweet, and they were out. Um, amazing I mean, band. Really, sadly, I think by the time most people knew who they were, they were out the door, you know. Yeah, a, they, the they Clash, blew up. Clash. They blew up with Combat Rock and fucking checked out. Yeah, uh, they were a flash in the pan, but um, uh, that's the clash, kids. That's the clash for you. Um, get on the website and check out that playlist. A uh, uh, pretty good one. Yeah, yeah, a riot of my own. And uh, check out our uh, Kindle book, fucking Sink or Swim. It's hilarious. Yeah. And that's as punk out. as you get that one. It is, actually. It'll it'll fuck you up if you yeah. dare to read it. Damn and strange. then uh, check out all the links from this episode and other episodes. And uh, peace out like a motherfucker. We'll be back with some more killer shit. We got shit planned and on the docket. So uh, get ready to rock it later right on. on.